compute. So good morning to Charlotte Cowell and John Goldsmith and Kian O'Farrell and Mark. He goes by Mark. Uh, and we're from all, all spots on the planet. And uh, this is, a, this is a, an ad hoc meeting to discuss Meditations on the Tarot by Valentin Tomberg and peripheral uh, subjects as they relate to uh, the meditations, at least historically. And I'm really hoping, really excited that Charlotte is here because she has just, she just put out this. Uh, I realized that this is a tome, first tome of a oh, magazine. Yes. <laughs> she has the first tome of this magazine and it is, it is delightful not only to feed the mind, but to feed the eyes. It has all sorts of wonderful illustrations. It's, it's thematic, it's got, well, it's, the, it's, it's got, um, the overarching theme is, is the, you know, the how the hermeticists hang together around certain texts and uh, uh, streams, of, streams of knowledge. And I have that, and I also have her other book, um, that she came out with last year, been very productive this last couple of years. Oh, you got the majors. Yeah, the, that's, the that's majors a heavy read. By <laughs> Geo Meebs. Um, she has done incredible work here. This is a very deep dive. Not that we who are studying the meditations on the Tarot the first time through, not necessarily that we're ever going to get to this level, but just to let you know, Charlotte has written this, um, this book which is an incredible dive through lectures that she, she'll tell you about. She managed to retrieve this from the dust bins of history where it was, it's been obscurely um, um, you know, languishing for years. So those are the two things. So Charlotte, would you like to begin this morning? Yes. Um, how should we do it? Because when we discussed how we sort of proceed, we thought, well, we could, we could sort of explore some of the major themes running through the whole arcana, because previously you were doing the letters sequentially, which is great. And um, hi, Peter. <laughs> and it's how, of course, Hello, we're Peter. supposed Hello, to read them. Dory. Hello, <laughs> Hi, Dory as well. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all. Wonderful. So glad you made it. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really good to go through them sequentially, but I think that it's also really great to look at the overarching themes so that we really start to understand the work as a whole because it's, it's a holistic work and all the tarot arcana interconnect. Um, I think there's quite a lot of people who say they begin with meditations on the tarot, then they get stuck or lost and they don't necessarily get much further. So I think if we can sort of understand how things fit together, it might, might sort of facilitate our overall understanding of it. Um, was everybody here? Not everybody was here last week, but did everybody sort of listen to what was said about the force arcanum? Because that's when we started to look at the neutralization of binaries, which is one of the, the key themes in, in the whole work. Um, and do you want you me to I, I well, let's of... interrupt? I want to ask you because I just finished reading one of the pieces that you wrote where you're talking about how um, the great synthesis of the zero arcanum, arcanum 11 and arcanum 22. This is a great tri trine, uh, triune, uh, triune symbol. And that's, yeah. I just wanted to say that as an aside. So when we got to force uh, arcanum 11, that's a kind of a crucial pivot point. And Charlotte was ex is excited to come in at that point. Sorry for the interruption, Charlotte. No, that's all right, no, don't be sorry. No, it, it is, it's, it's the center of the tarot. So that's why we thought that'd be a great moment to kind of recap on what we've already done so I did sort of rather than because obviously there's so much to get through I did sort of prepare some notes so that I didn't jump around too much I mean should I just kind of read off what I've done and if you think well you're droning on a bit now and it's it's gone on for you know two hours you can I'm you can, so you can looking stop. forward to hearing this I, I yeah. can't tell you oh, I don't know about well, you all but I'd love to have Charlotte help us have something to dig into okay um Okay, so we had um, a wonderful introduction to the group the other week, or I did, when um, you gave a great summary of the Arcanum Force, which, as you mentioned, is the pivotal halfway point of the 22 letters. And it's with force that the concentration without effort of the magician really manifests as the unfallen virgin nature who is effortlessly holding the jaws of the lion together. 
So having reached this point, we're going to recap on some of the major themes in the work, um, one of which we already touched upon, which is the neutralization of binaries or resolving of antinomies. Um, this is so fundamental to the whole of this work that I think it is the key emetic task that we have. I mean, obviously we're in, you know, as we discussed last week, we are in a world that's riven by conflict and these conflicts arise from false binaries, you know, people setting up political systems, opposing people, you know, things to do with race, culture, you know, there's so many divisions in society, but they're based on false binaries. Um, yeah, and our, our work as a meticist is to find true binaries and resolve them in a transcendental synthesis, which is the third term of a binary. So that's one of the themes. Another one um, relates to the use of the tarot within the Tetragrammaton, which is the divine name of God. Um, I do have a sort of picture of it. I don't know if all of you know the Tetragrammaton, but I can sort of, you probably, yeah, you probably do. I can send around a picture later if you don't know what it looks like. Um, so that's what we'll look at a bit deeper later on because that begins with the magician, which is the start of the tarot. Now to understand meditation on the tarot properly, it's, it's a work of synthesis. So most people are probably aware that he's got the anthroposophical influence, which he took from Rudolf Steiner, who was his teacher for many years. Also, he became Catholic, Roman Catholic in later life. So there's those two influences and often, <laughs> people terribly conflict over this, which is really sad, actually, because one of Tom Berg's you know, express personal aims was to unite those Christian churches, the Church of Peter, the Church of John, with meditations on the tarot. Um, but what's often missing is another influence, which is Meebs. So, and I think this is the most formative on him, even though at certain places Tom Berg does... He kind of, he acknowledges it, but he also disassociates from it. But really, the more you read the two works, the more apparent it is just how, how influential Meebs was. So Meebs was um, the head of the initiatory schools in St. Petersburg, um, just before the Bolshevik Revolution. He was the head of Russian Freemasonry in St. Petersburg. The leading, I think, teacher of Kabbalah, which, you know, if you think about some of the occultists in this school who, you know, talk about Kabbalah, Eliphas Levi, and others in connection with the tarot. Meebs really is, is um, he gives us far greater insight than any of those people. So he's a, a brilliant place to start, I think, for understanding how the tarot and Kabbalah can synthesize. And uh, he, he, he taught this wonderful course to, to you know, lots of pupils in, in St. Petersburg. During the Bolshevik Revolution, he, they went underground he eventually was, was caught and sent to a gulag, but some of his pupils escaped with his notes from the lectures. And it was these pupils that connected with Valentin Tomberg in Estonia when they were all refugees and initiated him into everything that, that they had to teach. And that's where his tarot journey began. And he does pay tribute to these people in Meditations on the Tarot. Talks about um, not just Meebs, but uh, Vladimir Shmakov, who's one of his arcana is translated in the book you showed and Nina Rodnikova. She was actually the, um, probably the main initiate of Meebs actually. She was given all, all the key arcana from him. So our ability to understand what's happening in the tarot depends on understanding Kabbalah to some extent. So I'm not gonna pretend that we're gonna sort of learn all of Kabbalah in one you know, Zoom meeting. I certainly don't, don't know it all. But the basic connection is that we have 22 Hebrew letters, basic Hebrew letters, and 22 tarot arcana. So, I mean, different occult schools associate different letters with different arcana, which makes it incredibly complicated. I think, you know, it's, it's easier for us to focus on the system that's being used here, which is actually happily the simplest. And this is, this starts with Eliphas Levi. And basically the first Hebrew letter is associated with the first arcana, the second with the second and so on. So that means that the magician is associated with Aleph, the high princess with Beth, the empress with Gimel, the emperor with Dalet, and, and so on. So that's quite easy, that's quite straightforward. Then there is a great sort of mysterious point with the fool, but I think that has to be for a different, <laughs> a sort of a, a different session, because otherwise we'll get completely lost in that, I think. So now Tomer doesn't necessarily make too much of the associations between 
Hebrew letters and the tarot, but he does call his arcane the letters. And I don't think that's quite an accident. I mean, obviously it's a letter in the sense of he's writing to friends and companions, but I also think there's a little bit of a pun in that he's acknowledging that these do relate to Hebrew letters. The one letter actually he does make a lot of is the letter Shin, which is connected with the fall. And there is a reason, I mean, that is, that for us is, is the most important one as, as becomes clear, but it's, it's a way down the line. Looking at perhaps force, as that's, <laughs> oh, the shin, yeah, that's why my publishing company has a shin. <laughs> because I puzzled over this for decades and actually, in, in Meebs's book, I don't know if you've got to this, Alex, he sort of, at a certain point, he's describing all kinds of things to do with the letter Shin. And then just as it gets really, really interesting, it, the, the, you know, whoever was writing it said, right, the, the master Meebs says that we're not going to say any more about this now. It's banned from publication. He's thinking, oh, you know, we were just about to crack the whole code and, he, and he, he's, he's put a stop to it. I do, I do have an idea of what I think he meant, having again reflected on it long and hard but I've not quite sort of formulated that properly yet. But if we look again at, at Arcanum the Force, so it's only if it's very clear but that's Virgin holding um, the lion, the lion's mouth open. So this is associated with the 11th letter because it's the 11th Arcanum which is calf and the basic meaning of this is the palm of the hand. So as you can see is reflected in the Arcanum because she's holding the jaws of the lion in her hands. And this is also where we start to think about the synthetic elements, because if you hold something in the palm of your hands, you have complete control over it. Um, to the point that they, this, they like this person or this thing likes you having this control. It's, it's something that, that you want. You know, and the lion is very you know, compliant. If it wanted to resist, it would, but it doesn't want to. Um, it want, you know, it's, it's consenting to that force at a very profound level which means that, you know, this ravenous beast has been restored to its true pre-fallen state of holy animality, which we again looked at last week. And then of course, there's the laying on of hands, which is divine blessing. The hamster hand, the hand of Miriam can protect against the evil eye. Kaf is also the first word of Kavanah, which is an important Hebrew term, which means concentration and having a true aim which of course was introduced at the start of the tarot in the first arcanum as the concentration without effort. So that's how we sort of see how, you know, what one of the ways in, in, in which the arcana are held together in a unity. So back to the magician. So the magician, I'm using cards by the way that this design was based on cards um, illustrated by Papers. They're, they're kind of, it's a modern version, but he, he I mean, they've kind of got Hebrew letters around them and Sanskrit letters, and he also was was synthesizing a lot there. Is that the Rider Waite deck? No, it's, it's not the Rider Waite deck. deck. It's um, it's actually it's the the, Me the Meebs deck. It's the Meebs it's deck. The oh my goodness! Oh. Um, these weren't drawn by Meebs. I mean, you, you can see in the book the illustrations we have from, um, yeah. and we don't have any. We don't have the originals of those, so they're sort of quite. That's why they're quite small reproductions because I don't know where the originals of those are. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. So they're all, yes, yeah, I've done the papers ones at the start and then the Meebs ones at the end. So the magician, as you'll remember, is the, the catalytic force of the tarot. It's the vivifying element of it. And being the first arcanum associated with the Hebrew letter Aleph, another of the three mother letters um, associated with air. We can also note that there is a sort of resemblance between the magician with his, with his one arm raised, the second lowered on the table, which is a reminiscence of the appearance of Aleph. You know, so that's quite a loose association. I mean, some of these tarot teachers, they did quite, quite make a lot of the fact that the symbolic pictures resemble Hebrew letters. It's more clear in some than in others. I'm, I'm not convinced about that wholly, but I, I, think, I think there is an association, but it, it can be quite loose. And here we see, recall as well, that along with the attainment of concentration without effort, without which progress through the rest of the arcana is impossible, the magician also gives us the method of analogy, the open recognition of the relationship of all things and beings as a means of understanding the profound complexities and the um, work of resolving binaries that we're engaged with. 
And as I said, I think that's that to grasp the importance of resolving binaries is a way of achieving this concentration without effort. Because if we always have that kind of like just fully absorbed in our being that that we're always trying to achieve a certain re resolution with the work we're doing in the tarot so that it becomes sort of second nature to, to see it in that way. I think that helps that concentration without efforts come. Now, just to, without <laughs> meaning to confuse it, the magician in this scheme is also associated with another Hebrew letter, which is Yod, which is the first letter of the Tetragrammaton. And it's with this spark, the magician being the catalyst, that you know you have the crowning glory and the key of the whole Hebrew alphabet with the odd, that the door of the arcana are opened. So it's the first principle of the Tetragrammaton. In this case, it would be the father principle, father of the cosmic family. The yod is followed by the he, which is the divine feminine principle, then vow, the divine child, and then the second he, which is, is the spouse, but also an integration of the, the three letters before. And here we start to appreciate the quaternary principle, that of the cross, to the work of the tarot. Of course, all the numbers are important, and that's, I mean, Meebs was actually a mathematics teacher, and he took the mystery name Butator, which is the angel of mathematics, I think one thing that if you do manage to get into his book is you'll see that he does mathematical deconstructions of all, all the arcana, which at first glance appear absolutely, you know, completely baffling and mind boggling. But actually, when you get into them, they're, they're quite logical, being based on Pythagorean principles. So it, it is logical. It's just a bit, it just looks a bit mind blowing at first. Um, so all the numbers are important as much here as to the principle of Kabbalah generally. Um, as I say, he, he Meebs emphasized this fact. And he says, let us turn to the interpretation of the quaternary represented by the four arms of the cross. So as there are four letters unified in the Tetragrammaton, so we consider that the first four arcana are one unity. So the mystical magician operates through Yod. The high priestess, who's reflective, has a Gnostic energy, uh, responds to this instigating active force, and that's occupied the position of hay in, in the Tetragrammaton. From this union um, arises the neutral androgyne term, which is the vow. This is the, in the position of empress, which is sacred magic. And through this vow, which is like a connecting letter, the energy that's learned from the higher planes is, is starts to, to be brought down to the next levels. And it's through this that the divine child, the product of this union, is nurtured. These three evoke the idea of the divine family, and the emperor, the fourth arcane, and then signifies the completed manifestation by the passive use of the second hay in the position of spouse. Everything, everyone with me, <laughs> with me so far? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the tetragrammaton cycle is distributed over the cross of the quaternary which therefore, thereby becomes a wheel that is set in motion. Uh, uh, there is an illustration of that, but it's not very clear. So you can see there's a wheel there and the, the letters of the tetragrammaton are set upon this wheel. Okay. So that wheel through the action, this, this starts to, then we have movement, then we have life. Very simply, the second hay in this sequence, when the wheel turns, becomes the first yard of the next cycle. And that's how, how we get some movement into it. He gives some, an example of how that works. If you think about, um, we sow seeds in the spring, that's, that's the first, the yard. They're incubated in the summer to the hay. Then we get the harvest, the vow at the third position, and then the winter period determines what will happen in spring. He also gives an example from masonry, being a, a mason himself, whereby you have the yard is the, is the apprentice level, then there's a companion, then the master, and then the whole lodge, which would be the emperor, is, is the second hay. So that's when it, it, you know, it becomes fulfilled. There are more analogies with the quaternary, with the odd corresponding to air, the east, the first hay to earth and the north, bow to water in the west, second hay with fire and the south, 
And then there's correspondences with the holy animals, um, Yod to the eagle, the first hay to the bull, the bow to man and the angel, and the second hay to the lion. So it's worth noting now that in terms of the sequential alphabet, the emperor goes with Daleth, which means, which means a door. So in so many ways, you know, when we've got to the position of the emperor, we are going through a door. We've, we've you know, assimilated the tetragrammaton, <laughs> in theory at least, and then we can move, move through to the higher levels or the, the further levels. But before going through the door, because we've only looked at really the magician and the emperor, we must first look in the mirror that is have consulted the high priestess of the second arcanum, as it's this reflection which enables us to embark upon the journey of understanding that was instigated by the magician through an act of pure intelligence. So having received the breath of spirit, and the odd is, is air, that's the breath of life, we must become conscious of it before proceeding further. And she represents spiritual healing just as the magician represents spiritual touch. Reintegrated consciousness born of spirit and the reflective holy water is born within the human soul in a way that is analogous to the historical incarnation of the word. The path walk this represents a return to our pre-fall state of unified consciousness. The move from magician through to high priestess, yod to hay, represents a unity of two rather than a false and conflicting binary or capital G Gnostic dualism characterized by the false poles which do not resolve but remain separated. As well as signifying the first hay of the Tetragrammaton as the second sequential arcane of the 22, the high priestess is also associated with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Beth, and the number two. So we see again how this arcanum epitomizes the binary principle and also in the imagery where she's flanked by the two columns of Joachim and Boaz. And she also wears a crown tiara with, with two horns, which is sort of like the, the brow chakra, the, the Ajna chakra, which, which is also has, has two points. The high priestess personifies Sophia and a pure gnosis. The successful activation of the first and second principles, Yod and Hay, naturally gives rise to the third, the vow, which is the great connection of the Hebrew alphabet, worthy of being placed with the Empress, the key to sacred magic. If Yod is the mystical spiritual element of the Tetragrammaton and Hay is the Gnostic, then the Empress the vow is the magical. It is the child of Mrs. and Gnosis, whereas the final Hay will be the summation of what's been revealed thus far. Now, Tomberg states that full consciousness of the sacred name can only be attained by the united experience of the mystical, Gnostic, magical, and emetic philosophical sense, which corresponds to these first four arcana and the practice of four different methods appropriate to these senses. So it's really worth sort of spending time with those first four before I think trying to, trying to get further through. The consciousness of the sacred name is one of the attainments that might be achieved by studying the tarot. It takes time, dedication, absorption of the way. It can't be taught, but only remembered as we attempt this journey back to the source. We're also told in meditations on the tarot that the Tetragrammaton expresses a law whereby mystical experience is transformed into a living tradition, a complete organism that results from the union of mysticism, gnosis, magic, and emetic philosophy. Without all four elements, it will decay and eventually die, which again reinforces the need to study these first four arcana as a synthesis. The, syn the idea of synthesis is, is really important to, to both Meebs and Tomberg. They're both sort of great synthesizers. It's with the second hay, the hermetic philosophical sense, symbolized by the standing, the fact that the emperor is standing, his authority, that we start to achieve the synthesis required to go further through the arcana and safely walk the path. This final synthesis, second synthesis, as distinct from the first synthesis of yod and hay, is achieved by analyzing what's gone before. So hence the, the recap and the work of the emetic philosopher. That's what we're trying to do now. Just trying to see. So the emperor is paired with the empress, the only one we haven't looked at, I think, who along with the connecting vow is also the third arcane, therefore associated with Gimel, the third letter and the number three. And she brings us to the realm of the theosophical ternary where you've got your binaries start to be resolved. Um, the archetype versus nature with mankind in the middle. This is a realm of divine magic. 
So by the time we get to the emperor, we've squared the circle, so to speak, and entered the quaternary realm, which is also of great importance to the minor tarot arcana, with its four suits corresponding to the four Kabbalistic worlds and its quartet of court cards within each suit, which also corresponds to the four letters of the Tetragrammaton. I won't go too much into the minors, but I think it's useful because otherwise we, there's already quite a lot of information will get bogged down, but I think it's, it's helpful to know how they connect because Meebs actually believes that the minors were the greater teaching. Uh, so you've, even though it doesn't sound intuitively correct, that the majors should be the more important. He believed the minors were. I think that's debatable. Tomberg didn't agree with him. He thought it was the other way around, but I do think it can help us to understand. So the first four suits started with the highest ones present a, success, a succession of active and passive stages which correspond to the active and passive principles of the Tetragrammaton. So the Lord, the, the Yod of the Tetragrammaton corresponds to ones, kings, and the world of absolute, of emanation. The first He corresponds to cops, queens, and the world of Bria. The Vow to swords, knights, and Yetzera. And the second He corresponds to coins, jacks, and Asiya, the world of manifestation. So we see from this scheme that initiatic progress, which moves from coins to wands, follows the opposite direction of the tetragrammaton letters because we start with the second he at coins and rise to yod and wands. This is because the initiatic path is not an aspect of the path of creation, which is descent, but an aspect of spiritual reintegration, which is an, an ascent, the process of sublimation of the dense to the subtle. These two opposite directions of passing through the arcana are diabetic, which is from a down, which is descent, and anabetic, which is the ascent. So as it is above, so shall it be below. Most path walkers are at the coin stage with their feet on the ground, attempting to refine their personalities in the direction of spiritual progress whilst living in the real world. A full adept of coins has mastery of both themselves and the astral plane and has also successfully developed, resolved and balanced their inner polarities to approach the realization of their spiritual androgyne. So that's, he's putting that at the, the, the level of the two of coins which is <laughs> there's still kind of 40 odd you know there's a way to so if you think you know so by the time basically you get to the end of ones that's probably where Jesus is at so I don't think we're expected to actually get that far but that's that's the plan um so looking at how individual minor arcana correspond to the majors the ace of coins corresponds to arcanum one the magician and also arcanum 10 and 19 because um they both deconstruct to one. So that's how, how he's doing that. Um, and 10 being the wheel, which is also Yod as the 10th arcanum and the sun. The ace of coins is the analog of the magician containing within itself the whole of the idea of the minor arcana, much as the first of the majors contains the inspiration for and potential of the entire major wheel. I mean, that makes me laugh a bit actually, because when I was doing the Yahoo group, I think we did this for 10 years and never got past the magician. We literally never, never got any further than the magician, <laughs> which was, you know, because everyone was just arguing so much about, you know, was he Catholic or not? Um, but it does also show that it all is contained within the magician anyway. The two of coins therefore corresponds to the high priestess and the two other majors which deconstruct to two, which are 11 and 20, force of judgment. As in the work of the High Priestess, the Two of Coins is concerned with harmonizing internal bipolarity. The Three of Coins therefore corresponds to the Empress, as well as the Twelfth and the Twenty-First, the Hanged Man and the Fool. This trinity expresses the principle of neutralizing binaries and the sacred magical balance of force which this confers. And I do think it's quite useful to meditate on those three images. Because if you do, you will see that there is a very profound correspondence between those three. All this means that the four of coins corresponds to the emperor, as well as 13 death and 22 the world. And all of these signify a sort of completion. So that you've got the sum of the tetragrammaton with the emperor and the door. Death, of course, leads to rebirth. And, and the world, it's, it's the sum of the whole, the whole tarot. It's at the four of coins stage that the disciple works on the quaternary, both in their internal and external life. They work on the four holy animals, the eagle on the mental plane, man or angel on the astral plane, 
bull on the physical and lion on the spiritual plane where they're all united. The quaternary arcana are where the power of realization comes into being. The emperor openly applies his force, his authority through will and reason, which is why his face is visible, contrasted with the veiled high priestess who hides her force and reason as she's guided by intuition. The emperor is leaning on the cube of his accomplishments. As should the disciple of coins. And also the legs and the arms of the emperor form a triangle shape above a cross which indicates the mastery of higher principles above the cross of the elements, which is his power to rule the emetic animals, both internally and externally. The associations with the 13th arcanum, death and rebirth, remind us that the initiate cannot remain stationary, but must continually transmute their energies as represented in the Rose Cross formula, in a natura renovator integra, which means by spiritual fire, all nature is renewed. And again, that's a reminder that even though we've looked at this first bar arcana, we have to then move on to the, you know, we have to keep that wheel turning and, you know, not stop basically. Then of course, in the final 22nd arcana, the four emetic animals have important placements. Um, we can note there that as in the cross in motion, so does the second hay become the first shot of the next cycle. So the lion, which would be the second hay position, becomes the eagle of the next. So just to spin a little bit back to fourth, which is where we began um, with the letter calf and Kavanagh, concentrated prayer might be quite handy to recognize this is also the initial letter of Kita, which is the uppermost sephira of the tree of life and it means crown. Four crowns are given to the Jewish people, Kita Torah, crown of scripture given on Mount Sinai with the 10 commandments, Kita Kahuna, crown of priesthood, Kita Malkuth, crown of the kingdom, and Kita Shem Tov, the crown of a good name, which is considered to be the best of them all. Five more crowns are identified in the New Testament, Kita Ha Chayim, the crown of life, the reward for enduring the trials of life, Kita Ha Sedek, the crown of the righteous, Kita Alam, an incorruptible crown, Kita Ha Tifereth, crown of glory, and Kita Hak Otsim, the crown of thorns, which only Jesus, the high priestess, is worthy to wear. And it's only Jesus who possesses all the crowns of both Israel and the church. And without him, you know, the crown of the kingdom would be lost. So we are attempting to follow this path, the way, the truth and the life, to model ourselves in his likeness. And here the letter Kaf again is an important ally as it can be used to prefix a word to mean like or as. Therefore, if we prefix Malek king with Kaf, Force. We obtain Kamelech, like, which means like a king, and an initiate in the great work is, is sort of charged with aiming to be like a king, um, to follow Jesus as the prototype and blueprint for the future attainments of humanity. That's it. <laughs> That's, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I hope you're still there. I, didn't, I hope I didn't send you to sleep. <laughs> That was just fascinating, fascinating. And to finish that off with a, the crowns, the summation of the crowns, which I've never, never heard before, the different names of the different crowns, that was stunning. I was gonna ask, I would ask you, would you mind repeating that last bit about the crowns? That, that just blew my mind. I'd love to hear that again. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, yeah. When I was thinking about, I mean, this is the wonderful thing about the Hebrew letters. And this is why they're such powerful symbols, because the more you think about them, the more these doors and these worlds just just open up, which is, of course, why they're wonderful analogs with the tarot, because that's exactly the same principle. You know, we're supposed to look at it and it's like, OK, well, there's, you know, there's a woman with a lion and, you know, how does that tell my fortune? But actually, <clears throat> there's so much more behind it. And and this is why I think that the letters are, are, are so valuable in, in trying to understand the tarot, because you have these wonderful correspondences. Um, so. Four crowns are given to the Jewish people. Kita Torah, the crown of scripture is given on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. Kita Kahuna, crown of priesthood. Kita Malkuth, crown of the kingdom. And Kita Shem Tov, the crown of good name, considered to be the best of the four. I think also of those four, it, I don't know if I'm remembering correctly, but it, it might be that it's considered that two are lost. I'm not sure if they feel the priesthood is still there or, that's might be something to check back on. 
Then we've got five more crowns identified in the New Testament. Kita Hashayim, the crown of life, which is the reward for enduring the trials of life. Kita Ha Sadek, um, they're using there the, the Hebrew letter Sadek, uh, which means righteous. So that's the mm -hmm. crown of the righteous. Kita Alam, which is an incorruptible crown. Kita Ha Tifereth, again, which you'll probably recognize as being the, the center of, of the tree of life, which is the, the central, central sphere, which is the crown of glory. And Kita Hakot Sim, the crown of thorns, which only Jesus as the high priestess is worthy to wear. And only Jesus is considered to possess all the crowns of Israel and the church. But without him, the crowns of priesthood and the kingdom will be lost. That's right. So as I thought, we think within the, the Kabbalah that we're looking at isn't quite the same as traditional Jewish Kabbalah. I think that was one thing I did originally have at the start, but to keep it a bit shorter, I, I cut some parts out. But even though there are convergences, I think it is worth bearing in mind that it isn't traditional Jewish Kabbalah which links the Hebrew letters with the Tarot. It's the, the Western occult tradition. Um, they're, they do converge in places, but it, it, is, it is somewhat heretical. <laughs> is it, it's fascinating to me, Charlotte, that the Hebrew and I, the Hebrew language, the ancient Hebrew language, is indeed there is a mystical energy that lives in the letters themselves. And this is something that is hard for us to wrap our minds around because we're used to dealing with our Roman alphabet and we don't really think much about it. It's a bit mundane, but the Hebrew alphabet has a holy resonance as does the Sanskrit language, the Sanskrit, the ancient Sanskrit. There is an embodiment of, 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 of so many resonances of wisdom and mysticism in the Sanskrit language. And I would say that you were, we were, I just got a touch of talking about, and I forget, I forget his name that, you know, the, who, who, who synthesizes all of this with Brahman. And he takes this to the Eastern sphere. Whereas, would, course, yeah. I would, would you say that, you know, Hebrew is the language that resonates for the West and that Sanskrit would be then the cores, corollary uh, sacred language, sacred, sacred alphabet and language for the East. Yeah. You, you, yes, you're referring to Vladimir Shmakov, who also wrote an absolute, I've got a copy of his book here, actually. I started to translate it, but it's so complicated. Um, that's, that's the Shmakov book, which also Tomberg refers to. Um, Tomberg greatly admired this, and this was actually quite a big influence because it, this is full of quotations. This is, I'd say two thirds of this book is him quoting other people. And indeed, you're right, he, is very, very into the Eastern philosophy, as was Nina Rudnikova, who was a good friend of Nikolai and, and Helena Rurik, who Rurik is probably somebody that most occultists are familiar with, you know, who's by far the most famous, I think of all these people yeah. and, and mm -hmm. the high achiever. Um, and if you see what Nina Rudnikova and Shmakova are writing, it's really, really aligned with Rurik and it's very theosophical. Um, and that's where I think the Eastern influence is coming in there. I'm sort of, um, and actually the minor arcana of Meebs, you see an, an Eastern influence in that as well. I'm not 100%, it's, it's weird because they're sort of actually trying to synthesize two incredibly different systems. I prefer the, the Hebrew. I think it's more understandable, but that could just be perhaps because I, I understand that better because I've, I've studied it longer. And it's also interesting in the Shmakov work that, he really has the fool as being the absolute, um, in, in Shmakov's tarot, the fool um, assimilates all of the tarot. So, whereas, whereas with us, you know, you can look at the magician and you've got the lot. With him, you have to look at the fool and, you know, and he explains how, how the fool relates to all the others. And it, it, there is a logic there because the fool occupies both the 21st position and the zero position. Um, actually the 22nd as well, because it's synthesized with last arcanum. But, it, but the fool really moves through the arcana. Like you could say that we are the fool doing the tarot. Mm -hmm. That's, 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 it, that's the, the one that moves through and we kind of can adopt that position. And he does go into a lot about the dream of Brahma. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about that. I think it's sort of easier to start with the Hebrew than, than to sort of, yeah. and then have a look at the theosophical aspects. Perhaps. Yeah, I would agree because well, we're raised, most Westerners are raised in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. 
therefore that would be more native to us, the Hebrew letters, even though they might seem alien at first, I found that uh, meditations upon the, the Hebrew letters, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Foster case, but yeah. I, have, I, have the, I have his meditations on Tarot, which, which co corresponds directly to the Hebrew letters. And um, it's, it's a marvelous little tome. Uh, I use that meditatively. I find that it's very rich to meditate on the Jewish, on the Hebrew letters themselves. They're just- he, He's great, old. actually. But the, see, that's a good example of how the different schools have different tarot associations. Because you've probably noticed that um, he, he has the, the magicians that does have in a different place, or he's got yeah. the, the fool with our life, hasn't he? Yeah. Which, which just you know, infuriated me for years because I just thought, why has he done that? Was it? You know, but they're, they're all completely different. Um, and I think actually, you know, I, I sort of softened towards all that as I got older and thought, well, you know, the Kabbalah is meant to be a living work. We, it's, we work with it in the way that, that suits ourselves. I don't think it's meant to be completely set in stone, you know, because we're all, we're all so different and have different paths. So I think we need to do whatever works. I think possibly Paul Foster Case was more into the Jewish Kabbalah side, perhaps, whereas with Mead and Tom, we've got a Christian interpretation. So that could be why. And of course, Levi as well, he was a Catholic priest. So, you know, a bit more, um, but perhaps that accounts for some of the differences. And of course, Alistair Crowley, again, that's a different, <clears throat> a completely different system entirely. So- um, Paul Foster Case, isn't he, he's connected with the Rosicrucians somehow, isn't he also? Well, it's, it's the builders of the Aditon. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a member of any, you know, I'm certainly not the person to- The Aditon, exactly. That's the word, yeah. That's, that's the organization. So this might be mystifying to everybody. I'm sorry to go off on this tangent, really, because that, that, I don't want to mystify this too much, but I, I'm absolutely fascinated that you are bringing this, um, at least a connection, understanding with the, uh, the, the Sephiroth, the, the Tree of Life, the Kabbalah, because we need, we need to understand how this all hangs, you know? Yeah, and I think the best way is to just, you know, get a list of the letters and, you know, as you're looking at the arcana and meditations on the tarot, just see, I mean, it, you know, of course, Tomberg, he's, if everything is a work of synthesis, he's refined it to a very great degree. Um, it's not always apparent what's, what's in the melting pot with him. That's why I think Meebs, it is, it is helpful to sort of understand as a basis where he's coming from, because it, like I say, he doesn't necessarily mention all the different letters, but really when you dig into it, you realize he is, he is using them, but I think he's putting a, a strongly Christian interpretation on it, which is good because he's bringing something new to the table there. Is you know he, he's Christian and, and he's you know he's, he's placing it within the tradition for Christians, which um, I I didn't find it problematic when I first read Meditations on the Tarot. I definitely would have found Meebs. I mean, I think if I'd read Meebs at the same time as I read um, Tomberg, I would have thought it was black magic or just occult and and frightening. And actually, he does. Uh, you know, there are some parts in that book because I've read them out on my YouTube channel. Some of them. And in a certain place, I'm just thinking, no, nope, not reading that. <laughs> That's really, you know, it, it just goes. And, and some of the groups he, in, you know, he inspired both, you know, the likes of Tom Berg and Nina Rudnikova and, and Nicholas Gears, who was really important um, for the Christian aspect. You know, he was a Martinist. But there's also, you know, some weird, you know, occult, black magical things that sprang up in St. Petersburg, you know, because because they were, you know, they were on the cold face really, you know, they were at the Bolshevik revolution, all the intellectuals were being, were being persecuted, you know, they were, they were really up against it and they were trying to find out <laughs> ways out of it by magical means, you know, I mean, it's, it seems like at a certain point in history, everybody in Russia was initiated into something, Lenin was, you know, you couldn't really get higher in Freemasonry than Lenin, I think he's been embalmed, he's in a tomb like a pyramid, isn't he, Lenin, you know, so they were, they were all at it, um, you know, and you had sort of the, the red, you know, the, the red Russians and the white Russians all, all fighting that out. And yeah, I think they did sometimes turn to quite strange, you know, dubious means. It, very much more magical than, than Tomberg gives us, like in the terms of what he would call sorcery. If you think that in the Empress Arcanum, he talks about personal magic, divine magic and sorcery. Some of these techniques they're teaching go more in, into that. Um, not, not always badly, but just things that we wouldn't bother with, I think. <laughs> yeah, That's what I'm making it sound even more. Oh, I've got to read that now. <laughs> See what it does. It gives a lot of people pause 
when you start going deeply into esoteric work, you're going to encounter the shadow side of things. You're yeah. going to encounter it. But I don't, I think it's important to feel equipped not to shrink back <clears throat> because there's <clears throat> there's so much richness there, not to shrink back. From That's what me says. That's what he says, because he actually explicitly says that his pupils were taught light and dark initiations, which mm -hmm. sounds like, whoa, really? Um, but actually, in his view, he equipped them because he's saying, OK, you can't be afraid of this because this will come at you. You might not want to curse somebody, but they're going to curse you. <laughs> so you need to understand. I think um, a lot of this is is about protection. You know, he, he was very concerned with the subject of egregores. Uh, of which we see massively at work in the world now. I mean, it's like egregores are coming at us having been gestating for decades from every well, possible would angle. Mind, would, you mind, would you mind going into that a little bit? So an egregore right. would be a, it's, it's like um, it's generated by the thoughts of people. It, it's a thought form that takes on a life of its own. So the classic big examples are Nazism and communism. So you, you have an ideology, you know, you start to, to win initiates to this, who then start focusing all of their energy. It's a very, very deeply magical occult process. And it can be, you know, you see it in all mundane forms of life in the advertising industry. You know, it's about getting the energies of individuals and groups focused on one thing, which then takes on a life of its own. You know, so as as communism, they would have built that egregore through propaganda, being the, the the key to. As with the Nazism, you know, it doesn't have to be left left or right or whatever. You know, they they build that through their propaganda, through their teaching, and through the emotion. I think that's partly why um, you know it's important to whip up people into a frenzy, because that emotion is then used to feed the beast, quite literally. Nowadays, whether or not people creating these thought forms are consciously engaged, is it is debatable. I think some of them are, but certainly at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, they were. You, I mean, the Russian mind, the Russian person was very much more in the magical world than we are than we are now. In fact, I would say that people everywhere were thinking about it. You know, the Victorians had their seances. It's only really in in the past. You know, since the world wars, perhaps maybe people lost their faith or they took that foot out of the magical world that previously was taken for granted that, you know, there was a spiritual aspect to life. Most people had one religion or another or they're into spirituality. Now that's being replaced by other things. So it's, it's not as obvious. But I do think that at the upper levels in society, probably not least of all, because there are a lot of people who are Masons, which is nothing against Masonry. But it is a system where magic is taught and people who are Masons understand that far more because it, it's, you know, their great leaders are understand these things. So, you know, I think like all the great religions of the world, Freemasonry was infiltrated by people wanting to subvert it. And it's, you know, as with the Catholic Church, as with anthroposophy, you know, there's people who want to do the best with it and people who want to do what they will with it you know you, I always think you know we, we had black magician you know there's a great era of magicians you know 150 years ago you had the likes of Rurik and Meebs and Gears, also Helena Blavatsky but then you had people like Alistair Crowley um you know there's there are positive things that come out of all these people and Helena Blavatsky I think she's an absolute icon I think she's she's wonderful but it did kind of mean that the floodgates opened and every kind of influence which to a person like her who's very high adept is able to work through that information even though she also got burned by it yeah you know, the average person just doesn't really know what's hitting them and i think now we're in a world where all these things are hitting people but it's not always clear where they came from and if people perhaps understood the kind of spiritual level at which they're being manipulated or led down certain paths they might pause for thought but i don't think they do i think it's it's all you know they see the surface level with propaganda or oh, advertising is a good basic example i think it's less you know less contentious you know people create these adverts they put them on billboards they put them on tv 
wherever they can. And eventually, you know, you want to buy a Twinkie because you've seen it, you know, 500 times. <laughs> and, and the Twinkie God, <laughs> has, you know, has converted you because you just, you know, you want it. And I think that's, that's an egregore. There's, there's also more individual beasts that, that Meebs was also wanting, wanting to destroy and those he called larvae. Yeah. Uh, I guess you'd think of a, the, the obvious example is sort of sync, uh, succubus and incubus of a sort of sexual parasitical nature, but um, he was, doesn't have to be, but he was very obsessed with these and he, you know, came up with all kinds of ways of killing these creatures, large or small, creating magical swords, doing this, really quite sort of serious, you know, you've got to, and I think it's, some of that was based on the work of Elipus Levi as well, um, you know, writing things on your sword and I don't think we necessarily have to do that. I do think, but you know, I think we can combat these things perhaps at a, at a mental level is, is the most useful for us. I mean, it depends what your taste is. I'm, I'm not really one for dressing in robes and getting a sword out, but you know, if it works, <laughs> why not? And sort of stab it, you know, stab a larva in and get rid of it or flame them. There's a oh. lot of people that really identify with Archangel Michael right now. I know I do. Yeah. As a, as a, and I understood Steiner believed he was a time spirit of our yeah. age, uh, the mm -hmm. age of consciousness soul. Mm -hmm. And so very much uh, uh, an angel of the sword and of the, of the fighting spirit, which I think we need to have right now. I really do. I really, the more I go into this, the more I realize the warrior in us is, is, is being called forth, spiritual warrior is being called forth. And a lot of people on many levels that I see, I keep my finger on the pulse of social media and I, I hear this resonating with a lot of people right now. And so they're called conspiracy theorists often, but the conspiracy theorists are the people who are opening their mind to the idea which we have stepped away from of spiritual forces at play in our world. Uh, yeah. they're, they're open to that and they're ridiculed for that, but nonetheless, I think that's part of the, 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 the thrust behind a lot of uh, cons what are called conspiracy theorists, which to me are just open-minded thinkers. Um, I think so. And also, you know, we, we're confronted with a lot of media. You know, we had the TV, we had the newspapers. Now we've got social media, which is all, you know, and, and we, we tend to be presented whichever country we're in, depending on what government is in at a certain time. You know, we get given a certain message about certain things. Some of it is is maybe right. Some of it's wrong. You know what? Some of it, I, I sometimes think with some of these leaders that they just don't know. I, I think you know. I think they're also doing what, saying what they think is correct, and sometimes maybe not. You know, it's just it's just what they want to tell people. It depends. I mean, I think you you know there can be egregores and negative currents coming from every angle. I think we have to sort of you know we have to walk the line there. It's usually not black or white, you know, it, it won't all be wrong coming from official channels and it won't all be right coming from alternative. We just have to try and get the best out of both of them. Um, and that's also part of the work in initiation. And Tongberg writes about this is not to be swept away by certain currents, um, to, but to stand firm and to, okay, listen to that, listen to that side, you know, but, but, but try and formulate um, our own genuine idea, you know, to, to discern the wheat from the chaff in every angle. I think Boris Moraviev, he would describe A and B influences, how the junk is a certain level of influence. I think those were actually, they might have been his A influence. I'm not sure anyway, but all, all the junk we're being confronted with is, you know, we have to just, just tune it out and, and get to that, the spiritual influence, which will inform us of what we need to know. We can only kind of balance and attune ourselves at the center, then we'll, we'll see the way forward. Whereas really everything is competing, isn't it? We're being pulled right, we're being pulled left um, by all kinds of forces at the moment. And yeah, I, I do sometimes wonder how people, you know, f figure it out. I mean, we're all reading all the time and at least aware there's a, you know, a whole other world of, you know, reality out there. Um, I, I, mean, I sometimes tell people what I'm reading and what I'm doing and the look on their faces is just completely blank. And it's like, well, it's actually not that complicated at this level, but there's just a complete and utter lack of understanding. And it's a little bit worrying that, that people, so many people seem to be losing that connection with spiritual forces. 
you know it's almost like if you talk about anything spiritual you might as well be be talking absolute gobbledygook you know they literally assume well you must be you know pretty mad you know to even be thinking about that and just that seems to be most people <laughs> that's <laughs> why i was so encouraged with uh uh with with the appearance of steiner and the spiritual scientist movement because i thought aha at least here's here's a, a way in to the, mm -hmm. the western empirical mind what if it's called spiritual science and there is a methodology to it which of course there is um, yeah you know that that was to me was a that's a way in uh for for some people i i think that has been a way in but i it, think so again, yeah. you have to get below the surface and you have to really mm -hmm. delve into something before you actually get to the meat of it and many yeah. people just have the attention span of a flatworm let's face it <laughs> Charlotte, this is, sorry. I'm going to say this has been absolutely fascinating. I'm so grateful. I just wondered if we could for a moment go back right to the beginning to the neutralization of false binaries. Because yeah. it, it has struck me that, that in, in, in the Kabbalah, God wants to share his love and his glory. But of course, when it's simply God being everything, I mean, he, all he can do is give to himself. So the first thing he has to do is to create a space where he is absence, the absence of God. Simpson, yeah. Yeah, Simpson, exactly. And, and this is uh, then is filled with life that God is able to give, to have an independent life. But that has, you've got a binary in two ways. First of all, you have what is God and what is not God. And it's going to be a long time before we get rid of that binary. I mean, there is such a thing as oneness with God, but there's also distinction from God as well. But there is there's another one in that the creatures who are in this not God space have got a choice because God wants to share his love and love has to be freely given and freely accepted with the real possibility of no, I am not going in that direction. Mm. And so in this uh, not God where we are living, um, you have this binary, those who are going towards God and those who are walking away from God towards love and away from God. And so binaries are not only dangerous, and we all know what happens when we get unbalanced and, and, and go around the bend. But it is also absolutely essential, because if we want to live lives of love, then we do need the freedom to say no. Mm. And, and, and this seems to, to tie up with an awful lot of what you and Alice w w were talking about. Why is it that, um, uh, you know, s s the sacred tradition seems to have this dark side because one thing it does do the sacred tradition is to say we have to make a choice and if we have to make a choice then there has to be the the uh, possibility of a different choice to be made so, so I, want, I wonder if I'm talking nonsense or, or what no I think you're right because I think freedom is God's gift isn't it and it's not freedom if we have to <laughs> if we've got no choice so yeah, I think it's completely true. I mean, I suppose what's hard now is the idea that people are being led deliberately away from a certain path perhaps, but you know, again, there's a choice, you know, I, I mean, is, is a choice taken away if somebody has been fooled or deceived? You know, do they still have the, the original choice that they did before? That's the trouble, isn't it? We have, there's this element of, of evil that gets in, introduced there that I'm not quite sure how we fit that into the <laughs> into the resolving maybe that would be you know beneath the pole i think because there's there's kind of two ways that binaries can be well resolved either above which is a transcendental synthesis or below which is just an unholy mess you know a, com a a bad compromise um that satisfies neither neither pole so maybe maybe people are being dragged into that perhaps as well rather than rather than the upward resolution this is a tough one <laughs> i think resolving the good evil binary that's supposed to be one of the i think that's one of the two great binaries 
of the whole work, um, the spirit and form as well, that there are others and also to do with consciousness and manifesting. But I think good evil is, is you know, that's the big one, isn't it? We're <laughs> looming large at present. I wanted to ask Peter, I noticed that he nods whenever you mention the Martinists school. Um, and so I don't know if uh, many of us are very familiar with the Martinist school. Would you go into that just a little bit? Uh, uh, Martinism in particular, I, I'm, I'm pretty well, sure you, Charlotte you will, Charlotte. will have a, a better just... idea of that. I mean, I, I nod whenever I'm in in consonance with what's being said. And I, I have to agree with John. It's, it's, it's so exciting. I mean, I'm not used to these kinds of spaces, I have to say, where more esoteric subjects are, are treated with with respect. <laughs> um, so that, that's that's really nice. Um, I really loved the the little joke you, you you found with the letters and letters being letters. I think that's a really Lewis Carroll kind of thing to, to have to have introduced. And maybe just one thing which I did want to share. I, I discovered Tomberg through a photograph, which I'm sure Charlotte is aware of, uh, the study of John Paul II, where, where yeah. there's a, a picture of the book. And I, I'd been aware of, of other things, but seeing it there and also have, at the time having, I mean, I was studying um, something to do with Balthazar, who, who ended up writing a fair bit about it. Um, but what I wanted to share was, I, while I was studying this, I was approached by a Russian woman who was studying cosmology. When I told her I was, I was reading for a degree in divinity, she looked at me and said, oh, do they still teach that here? <laughs> and so I think that in general, there's been, a, there's been this sense that the spiritual has been pushed to one side. I, I think that's changing. I think that there is a renaissance. I mean, certainly popular culture is so hungry for... for for any kind of mythology. And maybe that's where we get trapped very easily um, because there are so many people willing to feed us goodness knows what. So, so again, these spaces I think are so, so essential where we can talk about meaningful things and, and not be afraid of, of sharing how we're really feeling about them. So thank you very much, Charlotte. And thank you, Alice. Thank you all of you. That's how I came to meditation on the tarot as well. I read um, von Balthasar's book, Prayer. I don't know if you know that, and I, it just absolutely, I, mean, I just become Christian, literally kind of born again. And then I got yeah. a friend of mine gave me this book, uh, Von Balthazar, and I just, I went through the whole thing and read every, looked up every reference. And it was just like going through a magical door. It was, yes. I think that aspect of Catholicism is very strongly veiled. Um, you have to obviously put the effort into reading something like that, but I was fortunately in just the right frame of mind to do it. Um, and this whole world opened up. And, I, and then I thought, well, you know, I'm going to see what else he's written. And then I'm meditation so, I, on the tarot pops up. <laughs> and do you, I mean, re having read von Balthasar, I'm, he, you can hear Tom Berg's voice sometimes. And I, I find that, I think that's the great gift. I mean, that he gave back to the church. I mean, really, as a, as a son of the church, to give that kind of gift back to the church. That, that's, uh, my computer, by the way, switched off when you said, and I, I was writing it down, about Christ wearing the, the crowns of, of Israel and the crowns of the church. I think that's such a powerful thing. I mean, I, I would love to hear you talk more about that someday. I mean, uh, Maybe that was I a... Maybe send it around on email to everybody. If, if that I would was appreciate a, that, yes. A passage Thank you. everyone liked. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it sort of it was a little bit new to me as well. I was thinking, what more can I say about calf? Because I thought, you know, mm. I was going into it more myself. And I thought, oh, this is great. The crown, because obviously Keita, I was aware of. But these different sorts of crowns, I thought, oh, you know, that, that's, that's quite relevant here. So, yeah, I'll send everyone that, that okay. bit as well so you can look further. I think the picture of John Paul II, that's in the book, The Magi and the Fall. I think at a certain page, I've, I've got that picture on there. Um, but it is amazing to think that John Paul II <laughs> read Tomberg. I mean, that's the level, isn't it, that he was at. Obviously, John Paul, I mean, I, I still lament that we don't have John Paul II. Uh, to me, I was I mean, bereft that, when he died. Same. I mean, and, and that, that was Peter talking to John. That was, or, or rather, that was Peter listening to John. And that, that's, yeah. a, I think, a really powerful thing to have happened. And look what... John Paul achieved, you know, the, inaugurated the, the universal... Second Vatican Council's introduction. I mean, and, and gave us uh, a lot of change, and yeah, but but still rooted in tradition in that wonderful way that he was able to to do. Uh, and tackled respectful. communism as well. I mean, oh, that, the Bolsheviks, yeah. great book. I don't know if you're aware of that book, um, A Pope and a President. I'm not. I will 
Because apparently enough. Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were great, great friends, and there was a lot of parallels between their life experience. They both had an assassination attempt within six weeks, both absolutely obsessed with destroying communism. Mm. Um, and it's sort of looking at, at the two, and I haven't read a, any kind of biography of either of them, but certainly John Paul, I didn't really realise just what it was like on the coalface in Poland and, you know, the persecution of the clergy and what he did to, to keep that country together, you know, yes. during the communist years. And then obviously the, I was I was quite young when the Berlin Wall fell down. So that was the great iconic moment for me. And so that's brilliant, you know, what, what a good year that was. But I think reading what went before was absolutely fascinating and how Ronald Reagan supported that, you know, every step of the way. And he wasn't even a Catholic, I don't think, but I think some other members of his, of his um, government were. And yeah, they became really good friends. So that's, that's quite a, a book worth reading. For, if you're interested in this, you know, how, how communism is affecting us, certainly. <laughs> but Martinism, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on Martinism either. I'm not, I'm not kind of in, in, an initiate of any, any group. Um, there's so many of them. And obviously if I was, I wouldn't be able to talk about it either. That's another thing, because then you're committed to a vow of silence. But I do think this whole... Um, occult tradition, you know, the, the tarot, the Kabbalah, Rosicrucianism, Templarism, is broadly speaking Martinist. And I think one of the great principles of Martinism is the idea of getting back home, that we're, we're fallen people, um, it's Christian, um, but we're trying to get back to the source. And that's obviously a, a great theme. That's the point of going through the Tower of Arcana, it's, it's spiritual exercises the goal of which is to help us achieve reintegration. So I think that's where the, the Marxist influence really comes in. I mean, it's, it's a bit, it's one of those things, because I think Meebs, you know, received an initiation from Papers in Russia, but then he split, and instead of being, um, taking orders from the French school, he then, it became a, a Russian school in its own right, and kind of suddenly signed two feet. It seems that a lot of them split up from paper, so it just, I mean, really all magical groups just seem to end up fighting. And that's what Tom Berg says again, isn't it? He sort of begs everyone, don't, if you, whatever you do, don't form a, a group. Okay, we're in a, a loose group, but we're not in a closed circle. You know, people can come in and out and do whatever they want. But I think the idea of a closed magical circle, he just saw trouble, you know, because he'd obviously been bitten, you know, witnessed firsthand how, how people end up getting into fights over things that's supposed to be, you know, spiritual subject. So he shied away from that. I think there's, there's a lot to be gained from group work. I think, you, you know, you can overdo that and, you know, just try to be on your own. But I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if he was formerly a member of any, any club, as it were. It's so there's interesting. Lots of them. The dynamic between uh, individual work and group work is always an interesting dynamic. Because of course, you know, I used to joke about the forums that were talking about meditations in the Tarot online. There was never any much discussion. I just said, oh, we are dare, we all dare, and we are all silent. So we are daring <laughs> to be silent. And it was just this silence that was just resonant. And I thought, well, that's where the movement is right now. Um, and these things do tend to come above ground and then go subterranean. They tend to uh, fluctuate through history. And I thought, I really thought, I really thought I, I and I do believe now I am seeing the reemergence of of, of the, the, these, these thrusts of spiritual thought, which I think are coming to the fore again. And I do wanna catch the wave. And that's why I do think that if a group like this can come together, it, I, I just know that there is a, a smiling going on amongst the, the Tom Borgs and the Meebs of the, who are on the other side, the communion of saints. I really believe that they uh, are with us and are here to assist at this time. I think so as well, because I think this is the time they were, I mean, they lived through hell. I mean, you know, they had the Bolshevik Revolution, they had Hitler, you know, they had the Cold War. Um, but, you know, they also recognised that there was more to come. And I think this is sort of where we're at now, because we're, we're still in the fallout from all that anyway, aren't they? You know, the wars didn't fully end, you know, the, the, the destruction that happened there, you know, we're in the kind of final stages of whatever was unleashed at, at that time and I, I also feel like all those spiritual teachers from you know across the board really are, are kind of <laughs> rooting for us because I think they recognize just how needed 
how necessary they are, how much we need that influence, you know, to come down to us. There aren't as many active priests anymore. Church isn't as much of people's lives as it used to be. It just, it just isn't as important in life, generally, certainly in the West. I think, you know, in other countries it is. But for us in the West, it, it's lost a lot of it. Maybe not so much in Ireland. I mean, you might think you've got a bit too much religion sometimes, in, you know, because that's one place that has retained, um, I think, a strong spiritual tradition. But, you know, for most, certainly in England, it's, it's um, there isn't much happening there. Um, but yeah, I hope, it, and I do, but I do see a lot of underground groups doing, being quite active. And as you say, you know, coming out and, and speaking again after a long hiatus, it's just noticeable that it's not, you know, it, it's, it's kind of us, isn't it? Are we still in the catacombs? It's just that we found other people in other caves. Yeah. But, but Charlotte, I, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the consecration of Russia is beginning to happen? The Fatima prophecy, the, the, that maybe, albeit delayed, but that it is indeed beginning to happen in Russia? I actually think it did happen a few years ago. Um, even though John Paul would say that he did it, for me, I don't even remember. You probably don't. I can send, I'll send you a link to this story, but a few years ago, it's probably, it, it must have been, I reckon it was maybe five years ago, a pair of art students threw holy water on Lenin's tomb, and there was a news story about it. And I remember thinking when I saw that, it just leapt out of me. I thought, whoa, they've done it. Oh, obviously they were arrested immediately. It was a big scan. I mean, and if, in fact, the, the fact they were clamped down on so hard sort of told me all I needed to know because to people reading in Britain, it's like, well, who cares? if somebody threw holy water, it wouldn't even, you know, nobody would even think about it if it happened here. But in Russia, because they understand so much more the meaning of these gestures, these symbolic gestures, like the magical mindset is just part of their being. They recognize what they were trying to do. Um, whether or not they were explicitly associating themselves with the Fatima movement, I'm not sure. Um, we didn't get to really hear much of them after that. But for me, the fact they recognized it needed doing and made that really, that's a magician act, isn't it? That's a catalytic act. Um, whether or not it turns out to be successful is, is another thing. Um, I mean, I suppose we could note that Putin is now a champion of the Orthodox Church, but I don't know, you know, I mean, that's obviously very political as well. I don't know if that was a true sort of conversion he had, because obviously at one point, you know, all religion was was banned that the the Byzantine church would have been an imperial you know structure so I want to believe that his conversion is so, you know maybe I don't know if Putin has become I, I, do, I do wonder if he's become a kind of um because because really I, I think that that regeneration of Christianity will come from I agree with all you know the the, Tom, the, the, the Steiners and the Tombergs that it will come from Russia and so it makes sense in a way. A lot of problems have beset the Roman Catholic Church um, that haven't perhaps in the same way beset the Orthodox. So perhaps it will come from that direction. It would make sense as, as the Russian Church. So I, I think it's a process in motion, but because relations are so bad with Russia, which I, I, I hate the fact they're so bad you know, politically, and I don't, I don't know how necessary that really is. I mean, it's easy for me to say, well, we should just make friends, but you know, maybe well, it's- Don't you think that, that may be, there may be spiritual reasons at play, that there are spiritual forces that are diabolical, that are oh, yeah. Russia and the rest of the West in, in disunity? Oh I yeah. Really, I really feel that that's the case. I mean, the forces unleashed by the Bolshevik revolution, which, you know, Tomberg says as well, were absolutely, like say, diabolical. Stalin, you know, it, he, he was a devilish, a, a truly devilish person. I mean, everything they did, you know, it's, it's quite well documented how the, the Nazis subverted sacred symbols, but the communists were doing it, I, I would say even more. We just probably didn't hear as much about it because it was further away and it wasn't as, as documented, but they, they were like wholly engaged in black magic. And, and uh, Charlotte, what do you, I mean, would you say, I mean, with Stalin, I mean, because of the formation that he had received, he was even more able to, to perform those kinds of subversions. I mean, as a product of the seminary, as, as somebody who'd, who'd, who'd really been, uh, which makes it so much, I mean, more, 
sacrilegious perhaps? I mean, because this is someone who is aware, who has, and, and as John was saying, who is obviously making a conscious choice not yeah. to be in conformity with those with those teachings. That's that's um, true. It was it was terrifying, yeah. wasn't he? And and he had enormous power. I mean, I've, I've read some you know books where they've been looking at the relationship between the various world leaders, um, you know, Britain and America and Russia, and and really Stalin every on every single occasion comes out as the most powerful character of them all by it. And absolute, they always met where he wanted them to. You know, apparently. You know, Winston Churchill acted like a toddler. Like I think Stalin agreed to a meeting, and he literally rolled on his back and kicked his legs in the air. That's what his his secretary was just. It's well, what was actually quite interesting about that as well is that the assistants of the world leaders were all. I can't believe they're all being taken in by him, and they were all horrified. Whereas the leaders themselves all thought that they could bend Stalin to their will, and oh, he likes me now. I'll be able to persuade him so that also would indicate a magical hold over the people that mattered whereas these poor secretaries were tearing their hairs out you know thinking how do I stop it and you know and, and they couldn't and I, yeah and I think that the world ever since has been in an absolutely almighty mess because yeah we were between a devil and the deep blue sea weren't we it's like Stalin Hitler <laughs> what do you do um but I I just you know I was thinking about it the other day because I'm reading a book about Rudolf Hess's flight. I um, don't even know the Nazi deputy Führer and the head of the leader of the Nazi party made, flew to Scotland where, and crashed his plane and got captured. And um, there's a huge mystery about this. He was trying to visit the Duke of Hamilton because we had a great big, um, all the aristocracy of Britain and all the royal families from all around the world <laughs> came to Britain to sort of try and get further from Hitler. And um, they, were, they, were, they wanted us to ally with the Nazis which, you know, against start against, um, wouldn't have been Stalin at the beginning, but, you know, against the, um, against the Russians. And you think, well, okay, you can't team up with Hitler, but I do sometimes wonder, like, you know, could we have stopped the Holocaust? If we'd actually done that, would we have been able to, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, it's easy to look back with hindsight and say, well, you know, could things have been so different? But I do sometimes wonder if, if you know, we didn't, you know, because what good has come of it? Who actually benefited from what happened in, in World War II? You, you know, I just don't, I don't really see that anybody is in a better state. There is, there is one theory that the Third Reich has become the Fourth Reich in America um, through uh, the Project U uh, Paperclip. Yeah. Uh, bringing uh, Nazi scientists over to the United States that it never really died at all. Uh, the Third Reich never died. It just transmogrified into the Fourth Reich. Yeah. Uh, which we are still living under. We don't know it. It's so, it's so subversive and it's so secret, secretive. And it's, it's become ensconced in our very government, which is really creepy. <clears throat> people, most people aren't aware of this, but the Project Paperclip um, brought these Nazi scientists over here and dispersed them through other parts of the world. But there was a core here. <clears throat> and perhaps- NASA, Yeah, it became NASA, didn't it? <clears throat> and yes, and NASA, and perhaps that might be at the foundation of this conflict go ongoing with Russia to keep this apartheid with, with Russia. Well, that's, yeah, because actually it was American finance which enabled the Bolshevik revolution. So Trotsky escaped with $10,000. Um, he went through Canada. <laughs> Canadian and British officials did everything possible because it was a commonwealth country at that time did everything possible to to try and stop him couldn't stop him the american that certain forces in america absolutely insisted trotsky was going to go back to russia with all this money um i think he there's another country in europe he stopped off at. i think it might have been sweden where a man <clears throat> actually lost his mind and killed himself he was so like he couldn't believe what was happening um and lo and behold you know trotsky ended up in russia um, and the Bolshevik Revolution started, and you know it's quite a complex story. I mean, and the economic historian Anthony Sutton explains this very well. I've got a book. I'll try and find a link to his book. He was a very, you know, he was an incredibly eminent um, historian, Anthony Sutton. You know, his his research was pushed away, but he he sort of proved um, how the Bolshevik Revolution was was funded strongly from, I wouldn't say America, but certain elements like certain financiers, certain industrialists, as was Hitler. So the, the rise of the Nazi party 
was made possible through um, the support for industrial cartels that were given by American American industry, IG Farben, um, telecom, every major industry, you know, chemicals, um, electricity, you know, the Ford Motor Company is the one that most people know about because um, Hitler and Hess yeah. read it yeah. in jail and, and you know, they, they produced their book, which I think Rudolf Hess wrote, you know, basically wrote that book more than Hitler. But um, yeah, but it was, if it hadn't been for that financial support, really, they, the Nazi party wouldn't have been able to, but you see, you know, you could think, well, maybe they thought they were funding Germany against the, because everyone thought that the communists were the real bogeyman, didn't they? They didn't really know what Hitler was capable of at a certain point. I think it became clearer later on the terrible things he was doing. But, you know, in, in you know, the, the 30s, there was still a sense that, well, yeah, we've got more in common with Germany than we do with Russia. Um, you know, the terms of, of the Versailles Treaty were incredibly harsh. You know, do we need to address that? Um, you know, so there, were, there was some sympathy for the, for the cause. It's just that later, it, you know, it became so much worse. But, you know, so that could have accounted for the funding. Was it necessary nefarious reasons or was it just more a case that America wanted a, a bulwark in Europe against the communists? Mm. But, you know, we still ended up in a complete, you know, a complete mess. <laughs> it's, I don't know about you all, but <clears throat> I'm fascinated with the context that we're placing uh, the Hermetic movement into. It, I think it's very important to understand this because part of the problems that we've gotten into is because we've marched along in a rather ahistorical uh, way through, we just sort of almost like amnesia about everything that's gone before. And so we're, we're faced with having to maybe relive some of these lessons. For it's really work. difficult, isn't it? Because the war, it's such an emotional, both of the world wars, I, or I can't watch a war film without crying. You know, Remembrance Sunday, I'm always, I, it's a very, it's deeply, I'm, I'm sure it is with all countries that were involved, but for me, I, I you know, and of course you conditioned that we, we were the heroes, you know, it was our country, we were being set upon, and, and, and you have to really, really sort of, you know, millions died. I mean, Britain was almost, um, Hitler stood back from destroying the British army, you know, <laughs> The, the, that's not how the story gets told, but that that did happen. And you just think, you know, we we were almost completely annihilated as a country, and I think, you know, we, we're still trying to recover from that. So, so you need to sort of step back and look at the the road history has taken us on, with it without trying to be too um, pulled, you know, by, by by binary binary forces that that are trying to make it. Oh no, you can't think that because that's that's wrong. We've been told that's wrong, and you just have to sort of try and look at it with clear eyes because only then. Can you can you start to unpick it? But there is a lot, you know. That's, you know, you can't really. It's not that easy going through the whole of world history, is it? And trying to. But it's make... so fascinating to talk to Europeans. I, I'm going to sort of group you all as Europeans. So interesting for us as Americans, I think, to hear the European perspective because, of course, although we lost many souls in those wars, none of it was on our soil, really. So we don't have that experience of the earth shaking in the same way that, that Europe did. Uh, yeah, so and, and on the back of World War I as well, if you think how, or I mean, World War I is, you know, maybe the worst thing that ever happened to the human race, <laughs> possibly World War I. Um, it just, I mean, it, there's actually some, there's a wonderful person called Wellesley Tudor Pohl. Um, you possibly won't have heard of, but he's one of the, he's one of the, Sort of hidden masters, and he's well, quite well known in Britain. He he um, founded Chalice Well Sanctuary in Glastonbury, and and he was a real you know spiritual work. He was and he was involved in World War One, you know, the creation of, of, of Israel. He rescued the leader of the the Baha'i movement. But yeah, he you know just he was very engaged in helping souls pass over who'd been who died during the war. And he, he said it was unprecedented the amount of noble souls that died at once in the First World War was just absolutely enormous because really in that war, pe people just went innocently to their deaths. That, that was kind of, people were still at that point of innocence and they still believed in their countries. You know, if my queen and country tells me to do this, it must be the right thing to do. You know, that's the enemy, this is what I'm fighting for. And that mentality was still real for wh whatever country you, you were from. You know, whether it was Germany or Britain or, or wherever, 
and and a lot of those young noble souls died at the same time i mean he he believes that that passing over of so many noble souls was actually a kind of massive spiritual door opening for humanity um he lived through the second world war as well and and he he saw that as being armageddon because it was aerial warfare the war from the air so what's going on there <laughs> that's the police or something um he, he, he thought that was it, that, he saw that as being armageddon um what came after you know so i think to sort of no small degree we're still recovering from that I, I just think that the whole certainly the whole of europe is recovering from what's what's happened from from the world wars and i think we're still trying to figure out why certain things happened and and, and could it have been different and it explains animosities between countries i mean france yeah there's a famous rivalry between france and britain um which just goes on it, of course unless you know it goes back to way before the world wars um hundreds and hundreds of years but actually you know france <laughs> desperately tried to tell Britain and America that Hitler was rearming and we just completely refused to listen. You know, they, 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 cause they could see it. They could literally sat, sit on one side of the river and watch them <laughs> massing an army and building great big warehouses. And, 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 you know, we were just saying no. So, you know, could we have averted the war by just paying a bit more attention to what France had to say? And, and, yeah. you know, the threat would have been eliminated sooner. So there's so many what if moments, isn't it? But it does have a sort of a feel of, of, of fate about it, things being taken out of our hands. Well, fate has uh, brought this group together right now. Um, we're at the end of our time, but I'm going to stop the recording. But I welcome anybody who would like to stay and just keep chatting. I'm just going to pause the recording now.